Hey, thanks for clicking in. Around here, we upload videos each and every week. So make sure you hit that subscribe button for your weekly dose of encouragement. As you're watching this message, you may feel led to get connected to our ministry. Make sure you check out the description box below to find out how to do just that. As you're watching, you may also want to give to our ministry. There are many ways to do so, so utilize what works for you. Thanks for partnering with us. Now, let's check it out. Recently, a friend of mine had pulled me up because he could see I was getting really tired. And he said, you know, I think you're taking on too much. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I just, I think you're, you're saying yes to things more than you should. And I had heard this from a mentor years ago that had told me, he said, you know, when I was a younger pastor, he said, you got to be careful that you're not giving people you too much instead of God. And he had shared with me, he said, you know, the role of the pastor in Acts chapter five is to preach and pray for the church. Nothing else is required by the pastor but to preach and pray. That's why the first church created deacons. They, they wanted the preachers to be able to study and to be able to pray for the people of God. Anything else is a privilege, but everything else is not requirement. Preach and pray, because when you give people more than preaching and praying, what you are doing is you are giving them too much of you and not enough of God. The goal is actually to, to point people to Jesus and step away. To fill the vessels and push them to the side and focus on another vessel that has come, come in empty. And, and so I've, I've heard this in the past, but I'd ask my friend, I said, what do you mean? He said, you, you know, because you, you tend to go all in. Every yes you give gets all of you. And the problem with that is, number one, there's only one of you. But number two, you are stretching yourself thin and all of your yeses are keeping you from giving your all to the yes that comes with the calling on your life. And I listened and, and I realized, yeah, I got to stop saying yes to everything. But I also came to this understanding and made it clear to him, I'll never stop giving my all to what I care about. I'll never stop giving my all to the people whose lives God has placed me in as a man or as a father figure. Now, as people in general, it is clear there is a weight that has to fall on all of us. We all must carry something. The Bible says God will never put more on you than you can handle. But understand this, it does not say that God won't put nothing on you. It means that if you can bench press 200 pounds, he expects you to bench press 200 pounds and strain a little, but get it up. He does not expect for you to bench, bench press 205 pounds. If you're bench pressing 205 pounds, it's because you've put five pounds on yourself more than God intended for you to have. You're only supposed to carry the weight that God puts on you. The problem is a lot of us think that we are supposed to do in weightlifting terms every day 50 reps and get off the bench not sweating. And God is saying every day you get out of bed the weight is supposed to be so heavy that you may only get five up, but you are worn out. Are we carrying the amount of weight that God intends for us to carry? Because until we carry the weight that we are built for, I did construction for years and I worked at Northwest Hospital. I worked at stadiums. I worked downtown. I was a union electrician and I was running jobs. And often the, the people that owned the building would want to add lights and add chandeliers. And when I, when I worked at St. Agnes Hospital, they wanted to add a cross to the front of their building that you could see from 95. And, and we couldn't just say yes when they brought these ideas or we can't just say yes when they would want a chandelier added. We always had to go back to the architect. 
The reason we had to go back to the architect is because the architect knew whether or not the building could handle any more weight. We could have a lot of ideas, but if the building is not built for an extra 2,000 pounds, it could cause the building to start to collapse. When God built you, when God brought you into the world, he built you with a weight capacity. And he knows exactly what you can handle and exactly what you can't handle. But understand this, what I found is most people could handle more. And God will put you in a position where you have to carry the full weight of everything he's put on you. Where much is given, the Bible says. Anything that comes into your life, you have to expect for much to be required of it. This is what makes me say yes. This is what makes me say no. This is what makes me say I can add another mentor into my life or a mentee into my life. I can't add another mentee into my life. It's capacity. I know what I can handle. I know what I can't handle. And whenever I start to feel overwhelmed, it's because I have added an extra five pounds to my capacity. And that's why I'm struggling. And sometimes I have to take other things off so that God never becomes my overload. I never want God to be the extra five pounds. So that means I need to audit my life and see what is making my life so heavy that now God is becoming a burden to me. It comes down to am I making excuses or am I making adjustments regularly? But as humans, as, as people, we all have a weight that we are supposed to carry. And it's not going to crush us, but in every season, it should feel heavy. As fathers, as men, there are certain things that by nature that we are supposed to take responsibility for. I know times are changing and and, and, and women now will say that this is their responsibility too, but biblically there are some things that we are supposed to, as men, take personally. Now I understand due to the lack of a man in some situations, women have had to adapt this mentality to survive. But there are some things that men are supposed to bring to the table. I was talking to one of our volunteers and they had told me how their relationship had fallen apart some years back because the guy was insecure that this person made more money than them. And it became just an insecure thing. And, 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 and I said, that's so stupid. Because I, I, I would like a sugar mama. <laughs> you know? What's yours is mine, baby. I mean... You can make all you want to make as long as we still have the same debit card. That, that, don't, that don't bother me at all. Believe me. Because I know what I bring to the table. And I don't need to have the education you have. I don't need to make the figures that you make. I can flip burgers at Burger King. But understand there is something that I bring to the table that you with all your money can't bring. There are responsibilities that when I take serious, God smiles on, even though maybe I don't have the education you have. And the Bible makes it clear that as men, we have responsibilities. When it comes to the marriage, we hit this last week and y'all got excited. I don't know where that came from. I mean, it's exciting about marriage, but I've never heard women get so excited about submission. Uh, but the Bible makes it clear that in the context of marriage, the husband is the representation of Christ in the marriage. That means everything I see Jesus do in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'm supposed to do in my home. 
from, 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 from the healings to the relationship with his father to making his father's will as me all the way up, as Paul will say, to being nailed on the cross. That is my responsibility. I am supposed to be a representation of Jesus to the core. That means I set the tone for love in the house. I set the tone for discipline in the house. I set the tone for prayer in the house. This is why submission from women tends to be so hard is most of the time if we're not careful as men because we don't want to carry the full weight as I talked about. It's very hard to submit to somebody who doesn't want to lift nothing. It's easy to submit to Jesus because we see the price he paid for us. It's hard to submit to somebody who never wants to carry a load. And so as a man, I have the responsibility to reflect Jesus. I have the responsibility to show my home what Jesus would do. Mom can do it, but mom's not me. I have the responsibility, the Bible says. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He goes on to say this in chapter 6. He says, and you know, fathers, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers. I love how he doesn't continue to say husbands in the next chapter. Because I think Paul's trying to let us know that you could be a bad husband, but a good father. <laughs> to, e to every mother that tries to make the kid's father look bad because it didn't work out with you. He didn't cheat on them. He cheated on you. He didn't leave them. He left you. As long as he is fighting to be in their life, as long as he's paying his child support, I'll put that out there. You have a responsibility. As long as he's doing his part, stop making the kids feel like their father's an enemy because he's your enemy. And what most people don't understand is this. When you down talk him to your children, years later, your kids are going to be in therapy because what you are saying is, I hate 50% of you. So, Paul says, fathers, fathers, you have the responsibility to make sure your children do not grow up in an atmosphere of anger. That's your responsibility. You can either, he says, point them to loving God or getting angry. What are you reproducing in your kids? Are you showing them more of a love for God type of life? Or are they seeing your anger constantly leak out? Because provoking doesn't mean that you're pushing them, slapping them, yelling at them. No, provoking them means that you are living in anger more in front of them than worship. And so Paul is saying, you have the power to set the temperature in your house. Are you displaying more anger than respect, honor, admonition and love towards the Lord. Most people I pray for that are men, you know what their biggest battle is? And it's so hard to reach them. They are so angry. Angry at what they didn't get. Angry at what they're not getting. Just so angry. And it takes years to break through that anger. To actually start to mold them. And Jesus is saying, 
your anger is only going to reproduce in angry children. Remember, he told the husbands, water your wife with the word that you may present yourself a glorious church. How do you keep the anger out of the home? You bring the word into it. If the word is not coming into the home, then anger is coming into the home. And this is why everybody goes to their own rooms. Because the house is an atmosphere of tension and anger, and it does not point to the wife. It points to the husband. Like a dysfunctional church does not point to Jesus. Jesus has done his job. This is why 2,000 years later, the church is still growing. Jesus did his job. The problem is not Jesus. Are we doing our job or do we need to be enlightened a little bit? So husbands, don't not water your wife with the word fathers. Don't, don't, don't make your children angry. And being a representation of Christ. There's a saying that we used to say when I was in the streets and we would say, you know, real recognizes. Real recognizes real. And the thing about God is whenever God sees a father fighting for his family, God always responds to a father because when he sees a good father, he is looking in a mirror. He is looking in a mirror when he sees a good father because when he sees a good father, he sees himself. When he sees a good father, he sees a miracle worker. If I got to work two jobs, if I got to work three jobs, that's what I'm going to do till something comes. He sees a miracle worker. I'm, I'm going to go knock on doors. I'm going to do whatever I got to do. He sees somebody that is trying to be a miracle worker. And though they are not the ultimate miracle worker, but because they are in the image of God, they, they tend to have the mentality that says it falls on me. They are miracle workers. They are way makers. They are always trying to make a way out of no way. They're hustlers. That's what they are. A good father is a hustler. He's coming up with ways to get the family to the finish line. And sometimes it's lonely because the family doesn't understand the pressure that falls on a way maker. And they are light in the darkness. When there's not enough money for bills, they are speaking the opposite of the reality. They are light in the darkness. When you can't afford to even get your hair done, they're telling you how beautiful you are and how wonderful your nails look falling apart and cracked. They're trying to bring light in the midst of darkness. They're, they're speaking to the kid's future when they can't even afford clothes. They're light in the darkness. Why? Because they're like God. God is always looking for a father that says, at the end of the day, I know we're a family, but it falls on me to get us to the finish line. And that's what we see in our text today. We see a father trying to get to Jesus that feels like it all falls on him. His name is Jairus. He is a synagogue ruler. This is a big deal. His name means one that God enlightens. They name you based on characteristics and he elevated to be a synagogue leader. That means every time Jairus probably opened his mouth, people learned more about God. God enlightened him. He probably saw the text in a way that other preachers couldn't see the text. God enlightened Jairus. He's a synagogue ruler. But here's the thing. Synagogue rulers didn't like Jesus. And Capernaum, where they're at, is Jesus' base. It's his headquarters. 
if you want to call it that. This, this, this is where Jesus would come and go. This is where Jesus' office is. I've been to Capernaum on the Galilee. There's only a few things that remain in the city. One is Peter's house, which still remains to this day. They built a shrine around it 2,000 years ago when Peter died. Peter's home is there. You can actually walk up to Peter's home. And there's this huge synagogue. I may talk about where it came from next week. But there's this huge synagogue that doesn't belong there, and I'm going to talk about it next week. So come next week. <laughs> but this was where Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. This is where so many of Jesus' miracles happened. It was like the White House. It was his, his headquarters. And J. Iris is trying to get to Jesus which makes me scratch my head because Jairus would have been in meetings where they talked about Jesus. Jairus would have been hanging out with the boys and said, you know, that Jesus, you know, he is that, he is a wine bibber like they call him. He, he is the son of Se Be Beelzebub, Satan, you know. He would have got caught up in all of those negative conversations about Jesus because if the followers are talking that way about Jesus, you know the leader is. He is a synagogue ruler that probably scoffed at Jesus. But now his daughter is dying. See, God has a way of making you fall at the feet of the people you talk about. He took a risk because going to Jesus means, and the Bible doesn't say this, but going to Jesus means, Jairus, you don't have a job tomorrow. You think the synagogue boys are going to keep you around when the one they hate is now going to your house and walking down the street with a leader for two to walk together? They got to agree. J. Iris is at the point where he doesn't care about his job. He wants Jesus until you get to the place where you don't care about nothing but Jesus. You're not ready for Jesus. Jairus doesn't care no more. Let them hate me. Let them put me out the clubs. Let them, let them take my position. I don't care because I need Jesus. If I don't get Jesus, my daughter will die. And so all of these people are waiting for Jesus. And Jairus, it says in Mark 5, 1, begins to make his way to the seashore. And he is such a big deal that the people begin to let him walk to the front. Because he has influence. He has power. And there's no way that Jesus could tell Jairus no. It would be disrespectful. He is a leader. His position has Jesus saying, I must go with you. So when he gets to Jesus, he can't do nothing but fall down and start crying. And he falls at Jesus' feet and says, Jesus, please help me. My daughter is dying. Now, the tragedy of the text is that while Jairus is out getting Jesus, he left home to go get Jesus. He told his wife, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, gonna to find Jesus. And he gets to Jesus and Jesus is walking with him and there will be a, an interaction along the way. There will be a disruption in the journey, but he, he gets to Jesus and, and while he's walking with Jesus, his wife is home preparing the funeral. I wonder today how many women are preparing a funeral over your home?
a funeral over your relationship, not realizing that your husband is walking with Jesus. He just hasn't gotten home yet. He, there's been some distractions and some disruptions along the way, but Jairus is walking with Jesus. Trust that God has a plan for your husband. Trust that God has a purpose for your husband. And I know your husband for years has talked against Jesus. And I know your husband for years has talked about Jesus. And I know for years your husband made fun of Jesus and even laughed at Jesus and may have even criticized your walk with Jesus but Jesus is wanting you to know today that before it's all said and done me and your husband are coming home together don't give up now don't walk away now stop planning the funeral on the marriage stop planning the funeral in the home Jesus is walking with your husband and it's only a matter of time before Jesus walks in the home with your husband look at somebody and say stop the funeral stop the funeral Jairus has gone to Jesus and this is the last place anybody would see I think the people backed up because they're shocked you mean Jesus' ministry is getting so influential that leaders are going to Jesus now when they have nowhere to go? And Jesus begins to walk with Jairus. Because Jairus says, if you can just get to my house and lay hands on her, Jesus, she won't just be healed, she'll live. This is wholeness. I don't want to just get healed but still have to stay in bed. I don't want to just get healed and still be on a cane. I don't want to just get healed and still need somebody pushing me through the airport. He says, not only, Jesus, if you can get into my home, not only will my daughter be healed, but she will live again. See, God doesn't want us to just be healed. God wants you to live. He said, I came that you may have life and life more abundantly. God does not want you to just have church. God does not want you to just get well. He died so that you can live. So Jesus went with him. And many people are grabbing Jesus and ripping at Jesus. But Jesus is walking because Jairus' daughter is dying and this is a father coming to God. And Jesus has so much respect for fatherhood because he's a good son. He said, you know, my meat is to do the will of my father, my father, my father. He said, actually, if you don't understand fatherhood, you can't even pray well because the Lord's prayer starts off with our So Jesus sees a father. He has respect for fatherhood. He is a father in a lot of ways. And he is looking at a mirror of himself, crying. And he doesn't fight J. Iris. He walks with him. Because his daughter is 12 years old and she is dying. Her dreams are dying. She will never go to a prom. She will never have her first kiss. All of her potential is laying sick in a bed ready to take its last breath. And she's heard stories about how when Jesus was 12, he was preaching in the temple. How is it that one person is blooming at my age and I'm falling apart. His little girl is dying. And I'm so glad she had a father that said, I will swallow my pride and get to Jesus. I'm so glad she had a father that said, I will press through the crowd, embarrass myself, risk my job because my little girl means everything to me. I am so glad that she had a father that felt like 
it all falls on me. And I think, because I know what being a leader can do. I've made horrible mistakes as a leader. There were times I put my leadership in front of my family, my leadership in front of my priorities. Because when you're trying to build something, especially for God, sometimes you become like a racehorse and only get focused on what's straight ahead. And I know for J. Iris to become the leader of the synagogue means he had to miss some dances. And he had to miss some award ceremonies. And maybe the reason the wife is preparing the funeral is because he's missed quite a few dinners. And this is his chance to make up for what he wasn't. This is his shot to say, I missed all of this in your life. But if daddy can get to Jesus... Jesus can make everything better. To every father that feels like you've ever missed something, Jesus says, if you can just get to me, I'll make everything better. So Jairus is walking with Jesus. Jesus is walking with Jairus. And the people are trying to grab him. And then what happens is we get a pause in the story, a pause in the journey, and we get taken to another part of the city where there's a woman, not a girl, a woman, a grown woman who has an issue. She has had an issue of blood for 12 years. Jairus' daughter is 12. She has an issue that's lasted for 12. That means when Jairus and his wife were so happy one day and screaming of, with joy one day, she walked out of the doctor's office crying. Their happiest moment of their marriage was the most devastating moment of her life. It's crazy to me how one person in the same city, like Capernaum, like the same job, like the same church, like the same family, one person can be going into their best season and another person can be beginning their worst season. They've had 12 years of happiness She's had 12 years of depression. She has an issue of blood that will not stop. She will eventually die from this. She cannot stop the bleeding and in Jewish culture, she could not be touched and she could do no touching. Whoever she touched was unclean. Whoever touched her was unclean. Imagine 12 years of not just being depressed and not just having an issue, but 12 years of seeing everybody get to be touched but you. A grown woman that's beginning to forget the last time she was ever touched. Touch brings affirmation. Touch makes you feel loved. Imagine 12 years of nobody hugging you. 12 years of nobody touching you. And I know she don't have a father like Jairus. Because if she had a father, she wouldn't have to press through the crowd herself. There are people here that have had to press harder than you should because there was no father figure in your life. And she's looking at Jairus and saying, I wish I had a dad like that. I wish I had a dad that loved me like that. I wish I had a dad that let me stay in the bed. But because I don't, I got to get out of the bed feeling nasty and feeling disgusting. In the hot, 
Judean weather. I am sweating and bleeding all at the same time. Because I don't have a father. And so she says to herself, this is where it always starts. Your change always starts with what you say to yourself. If you don't say it to yourself, stop expecting anybody else to. If you don't call yourself successful, don't expect nobody else to. If you don't call yourself beautiful, don't expect nobody else to. If you don't call yourself smart, don't expect nobody else to. If you don't think you're handsome, nobody else will. If all you see is your flaws, you are going to teach people to see what you see. She said within herself, what are you saying to yourself? She said, if, if I can just... Get through this crowd and touch the hem of his garment. I will be made better. I will be made whole. Life has pushed her here. It says she tried every doctor. She tried every physician. And here's the tragedy. They took her money. They took her money but they didn't make her better. They took her money, but they didn't make her better. In fact, it would have been better off if she never met him. Because it says they did not make her better. They only made her worse. How many have some people that when it was all said and done, you said to yourself, I never, wish I never met you in the first place. <laughs> Every time she went to a doctor or a physician, she thought this was going to be the day only to experience letdown after letdown after letdown. And hope deferred makes the heart sick. And now all of her money is gone. See, I can struggle, but struggling in Nice is a lot different than struggling in Dundalk. Struggling in the Caribbean is a lot different than struggling in South Baltimore. It's one thing to struggle and be able to make choices. It's another thing to struggle and have no resources. So, J. Iris is at the point where he only has the option of getting to Jesus. This girl, because she has no money and she can't afford another doctor's appointment, she has no choice but to get to Jesus. And she's talking to herself about this moment. And she presses through the crowd. And she can't touch Jesus. But she touches his garment. His garment. She touches his robe as he's walking. See, sometimes when you can't get the skin, you got to settle for the clothing. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, it, I can't touch him because of my sickness, but if I can just touch the hem of his garment, this whole thing can go away. 12 years of pain can change in a moment if I can just. Do you not realize that if you had that mentality today, I don't care if it's been 12 years or 20 years or 30 years of pain. If you could say to yourself and believe that if I touch Jesus, everything could be made better. You just might see an immediate kind of healing hit your life. She said to herself and she pressed through the crowd, you got to be willing to do whatever it takes to get what God has for your life. Amen. And Jesus says, 
Who touched me? Jesus, Peter said. All of these people are grabbing you. What do you mean, who touched me? No, 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 Peter. They came to church to grab me. But they didn't come to church to touch me. They, they, they came to Capernaum to meet me at the seashore to grab a blessing. But they didn't come to touch me. See, there are people here right now, people watching online, that came to grab God. But you did not come to touch God. Because he is touched by the feeling of our infirmities. If we can't feel it, he can't feel it. So to say, Lord, I want to touch you means that before I leave, I've done something that makes you step back and feel touched. Have you ever had somebody do something that just touched you? It was simple. It was simple. People were bringing me Father's Day gifts in my office this morning and, and saying Happy Father's Day to me. And, and they know me enough by now to know that big gifts don't impress me. It's, it's the little cups that have my name in them. It's the coffee mug, not the one you bought from the Christian bookstore that says the Lord is my shepherd on it. But, but that one that you put thought into, that one that, that you ran to a couple different places to have it done special, it's, it's touching when people go out of their way to show you love. When's the last time you went out of the way to touch God? Just to make him step back and say, my, my daughter loves me. My, 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 my son loves me. Look at how they worship me. Look at how they give. Every time they come to church, they touch me. And here's the difference between the people that grab Jesus and the people that touch Jesus. The people that touch God feel power from God. For all the people that grabbed him didn't get a blessing. But when the one that touched him, the reason he said who touched me is because he felt power leave him. At some point, touching God will be a priority in your life because at some point, you're going to need power to flow into your life. He says, who touched me? Who touched me? Are you touching God today? Are you touching him? Have you touched him on Father's Day? Who touched me? And she falling down, trembling and scared, told her everything. Here's how God knows who touched him. You get to the place, as the song says, where you are from this day forward withholding nothing. I know a person has been touched by God when they withhold nothing. From, as long as God has to fight you to do what the Bible tells you to do, you're still withholding stuff. But when God sees, as a father, where is my honor? When God sees that you're withholding nothing, that is the indicator that you can be trusted with power. And I always read this and thought this was the point of the text that she gets healed, the touching of the garment. But that's not the point of the text. That stopped the sickness. Remember, Jaira says, I want my daughter healed, but I also want her to live. Jesus has healed this girl. But what's going to keep her from living? And then I saw it. Remember, Jairus' daughter had a daddy that fought for her. Jairus' daughter had a father that pressed through the crowd, put his reputation on the line. This girl has no father. It'll be hard for her to live feeling like she's all alone. So what does Jesus say to her? 
daughter. Daughter. He won't call Jairus his daughter, daughter. Daughter. And what is Jesus showing Jairus? That you, your daughter may have a father in her life that will fight for her. But don't get it twisted. I am a father to the fatherless. I will always stop when those that call me a father have a need. I'll always stop when those that call me father feel like they have nothing left to offer, feel like they have no money, feel like they have no love, feel like they have no strength. God says, for every one of my children that tries to touch me, I promise I will always stop for you. I will never be too busy for you. See, Jairus' daughter had an appointment. This girl had no appointment. This girl was just relentless. This girl was just hungry. And what I've learned in life is that usually people that don't have a lot in life, usually people that have had to make things happen for themselves, when the time comes for God to bless them, they tend to be hungry. They tend to want it. They tend to be relentless. They tend to not take no for an answer. They tend to take a risk, a risk of being rejected, a risk of being corrected, a risk of being turned away. She got to the place where she said, I just want to touch the man that has the cure for my problem. And what she was really touching was a father. And maybe God let her struggle for 12 years so that she would finally get to the place where she would be so broken that she would be ready to be a daughter. Maybe it took 12 years for her to get to the place where she would re receive God calling her daughter. Pride will have you saying things like, I ain't your daughter. You ain't my father. I have one father. You are not my father. But by the time God gets done breaking you, you know that you are ready to be blessed because if not, can he be a father? It's can you be a child? And now keep in mind, and he looks at her and says, your faith has made you whole. You have the faith to see me as a father. I have the power to restore you as a daughter. Your faith has made you whole. Now understand that while all of this is taking place, and she's not the star of my text today, Jairus, is sitting and watching. And you just have to picture the look on Jairus' face. The whole time this is taking place. Have, have you ever had an appointment and have somebody step in front of you? You, you get it? And, and that's for a sandwich. That, that's to check out. Imagine having an appointment to have your daughter healed while she's dying. And Jairus is just sitting there because this little girl stole a blessing. She has no name. He has a name. She has no name and she stole a miracle. See, it is possible for you to steal a miracle from God. To steal a blessing from God. To step in front of somebody that's in their appointment season. Amen. And Jesus is trying to show Jairus too. That the way you fight for your daughter is the way I always fight for my daughter. Yeah. My daughter texts me. I was in Dallas. And she said our, 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 our dog had to go to the ER and they were... They were trying to keep him alive, you know, and I was like, the dog has a lot of sentimental value to our family, a family member. If you follow her on Instagram, you know, she's always posting pictures with him. And I said, can they keep him alive till I get there? Because I didn't want her to have to make the call to put him down. 
And they kept them on oxygen and stuff. And I prayed. I said, Lord, I just need you to keep them around till I get there. If, if, if you, you, you can see fit to do it, give us a little bit more time with them. But I said, but keep them alive till I get there. They said to keep them alive till you get here is going to be over $2,000 for oxygen, to keep them on oxygen and all this stuff. And I was like, $2,000? <laughs> but I said, I don't care. Do it. I was at an engagement. I had to leave it. I caught the first plane out of the city back home. I got in and yeah, they got in and they, they said he could go home. He's, he's running around now in the back watching him, you know, and, you know, and prayerfully, you know, he's going to be around for a little while. But when she called me crying, it was a no brainer to get home because it's priorities. It's priorities. It's what you do. When somebody calls you father, when they're hurting, you hurt. Jesus is showing Jairus that when my children hurt, they become my priority. And Jairus is watching Jesus be a daddy while he's trying to be a daddy to his daughter. And while Jesus is getting done, because this is what the devil does. While Jesus is getting done, they come in to say, don't bother him no more. Your daughter's dead. <laughs> He's walking with Jesus and now bad has gotten horrible. Have you ever walked with God and seen bad turn horrible? And Jesus says right away, he says, Jairus, do not be afraid. Only believe. Do not be afraid, only believe. You did the hard part. You've got me on the journey with you. Do not be afraid, only believe. See, the devil wants to shake you up when God is close to changing the thing you've been praying for. He's always going to make you afraid. He's going to tell you, be afraid you're getting too old. Be afraid the arguments are getting too loud. Be afraid your daughter's getting further and further away from God. Be afraid your son is drifting further and further away from God. He always wants to bring fear into the season where you feel that God is the closest. And Jesus is reminding, like I'm reminding, don't be afraid, only believe. Don't be afraid, only believe. He's talking to this dad. Don't be afraid, only believe. Don't be afraid, only believe. I don't know what dad needs to hear that today, but don't be afraid, only believe. Don't be afraid, only believe. If, if Jesus is walking with you, it's going to be okay. And Jesus is listening. And Jesus goes with him. And they get to the house and his wife has prepared the funeral. The tragedy of being a husband, going home with Jesus. But you're really not going to a home. You're going to a funeral parlor. I wonder how many wives have created a funeral parlor. There's no more excitement. You've just bought into the negativity and created the atmosphere that goes with it. There's no more laughter. There's no more joy. You just created the funeral parlor. It smells like one when you go home. And here it is, Jairus has been so broken and put it all on the line to get Jesus. And they walk into the door because in biblical days, they would hire mourners that would just stand around and cry and scream to make it real dramatic. And Jesus walks into the house and sees the party and says, why are y'all dying or crying? She ain't dying. She ain't dead. She's sleeping. She's taking a nap. This ain't permanent. And you know what they did? They laughed. They laughed him to scorn. That means they weren't just laughing, but they were demeaning Jesus. 
<laughs> and you know what Jesus does? I remember back in the day, I used to watch Martin all the time. And Martin would always have this phrase when people pushed the line too far or, or pushed him, he would say, get the stepping. And he would slam the door on them when they walked out. Jesus tells the whole room, get the stepping. See, all of these people got into the room. But because they took God as a joke, they got put out. It is easier to get into rooms than to stay in rooms. God will always put you out of a room when you don't believe his promises. God will always put you out of a room when you laugh, when he's serious, when he says he's going to do something, but, but you don't really believe it. What it shows is that you are not ready for the room that you found yourself in. So Jesus puts them all out because here's the catch. He cannot perform in toxic atmospheres. See, there are people right here. The reason God ain't doing it is because you have created an environment he can't perform in. He does not perform in environments that laugh at his power. Who's in your circle that could be keeping God from performing? He had to clear the house. He had to clear the house because the wrong people were there. Do you have the wrong people in your life to pull off what God is trying to do? He clears the house. He clears the house. I've learned that whenever God takes you to a new level, you have to be okay with God clearing your house. And he took Peter, James, and John and the mother and father in. And the five of them walk into the room. Five's the number of grace. Grace has just stepped into the room. And he does not heal the girl. He says, arise. Because he did not come to heal Jairus' daughter. He came to resurrect his daughter. And God is saying to every frustrated parent, Get ready for God to not just heal the child, but God is getting ready to resurrect the child. And he looks at Jairus and his wife and says, don't tell nobody about this. And feed her. Give her bread to eat. Feed her. Because every miracle from God comes with stipulations. Most people ask God for the blessing, but they never say, what are the rules that come with it? Lord, I want a man. There's rules. Lord, I want a woman. There's rules. Lord, I want a six-figure job. There are rules. Lord, I want to be a leader. Rules. Most people pray for the blessing, but never ask God about the small print. There are stipulations. He says, Jairus, this miracle means that in your home, there is about to be a whole new normal. If you really want this to happen, there is going to be a whole new normal. And, and here's where it comes in. Jairus, you've been doing such a good job as a synagogue leader. Feeding the people of God. You don't get to be the leader if you can't feed. <laughs> you have done such a good job feeding the people of God. And God will give you shepherds after his heart to feed the flock. You have fed the flock. But father to father, Jesus says. Jairus, in this season, you will no longer feed your career. You will feed your family. If I can get you to feed your family, I'll take care of the rest. 
Because Jairus, this weight falls on you. You've been taking your career serious and you've been a public success, Jairus. But you are a private failure. The people closest to you would say, you are a private failure. There are certain people I look at in this room when I'm preaching. And then there are other people I could care nothing about what they think about me. But the people that I've raised, like Modesty and Jalen, my God kids, spiritual kids like Colleen and, and Ursula and, and Maris and all of them, like I look at their eyes. Because if everybody claps and they're sitting down, that means I have fed the people of God, but I have failed the people I do life with. Do you care about the people you do life with? Do you care about that sparkle in their eye? Do you care that they stand up when you walk in the room? Not everybody else. Are you feeding your home? Are you digging into the word and sharing it with the family? You know why I'm up here today? I'm not up here because of a great preacher. I met some great preachers along the way. I met a great preacher to mentor me, but I'm not up here because of any great preacher. I'm up here because of a construction worker. A construction worker who was a brother-in-law of a girl I dated all through high school into my 20s. I watched him for years model being a Christian man. I've shared this story often. His name's Curtis. And I would watch him for years. He started his own little company and they struggled a little bit. But I would watch him every morning get up at 4.30 and start his day off praying. Because he'd invite me over sometime to pray. Then he'd go to the gym for an hour, come home, shower. He'd go straight to work. Come home. I always see him out in the yard doing something. He made dinner for his wife. Because she worked in Philadelphia and caught the train four days a week. So before she ever got home, he helped their daughter out with homework, had her homework done, had dinner cooked. And by the time his wife Lisa walked in the door, dinner was on the table. I watched him. I watched him say grace. Every Sunday in order for me to come to the house all through the week, I had to eat Sunday dinner with the family. It was a non-negotiable with Curtis. You do not come into my house Monday through Saturday if you miss Sunday dinner. And there would be times I'd miss it and he'd say, what are you doing here, dude? You know the rules. Go sit down on the porch with her. And he would go around the table and he would tell everybody a compliment. He would make his daughter go around the table and tell everybody something nice about everybody at the table. He'd go around and ask everybody, how's your week been? And then he would look me dead in the eyes at the table and say, James, man to man, in front of his wife, in front of my girlfriend, in front of his daughter, have you had sex in my house this week? Have you touched my sister-in-law this week? And I was so scared that eventually he got that all out of my system. Because I knew every Sunday it was coming up. I saw a man that didn't show two different images to me. It was one consistent image. He always went to church. He got there early in the morning to serve every single week. He pulled me in to serve and drive the church van around. He, he was just a construction worker. He was just a normal dude. He taught me about tithing. When I first got saved, he was like, James, you tithing, man? He was like, I, you, you got to do this, dude. And he would sit at the kitchen table and ask me if I was tithing. He would say, you got to get this together or I can never okay you all getting married. Because she's going to college and we taught her to tithe and we ain't going to have her money cursed because of you. He would say, I'll work with you on it, man. I'll help you with it. 
And when my car would break down and I couldn't afford a mechanic, he'd come over and change my brakes for me. He'd come over and work on my engine. He had connections. He'd put my car in the shop and get him to do it for free. He was meeting me where I was, but he was teaching me these things because I didn't learn these things as a child. And every night he got up from dinner, he would go watch TV with his family for an hour and a half, two hours. He would take his daughter up to the bedroom. He would literally, this is every day. He would pray for her, read her a bedtime story. He'd come downstairs, and I can't say I ever quite perfected this part, but he would rub his wife's feet for about an hour. Yeah. I never got that part, but I worked on all the other stuff. But he would rub her feet for an hour. And then he would tap the table and that meant we're going to bed together. And they would both get up, not one stay up later than the other. They would both get up and go upstairs and do their devotional and pray and go to bed. Monday through Sunday. If he had to travel for work, it was a whole FaceTime party at dinner table. He would literally be in a hotel room on FaceTime with the family, eating hotel food, doing the same routine as things were turning. And I got saved, not because I heard a preacher, but because I saw a man live a life that spoke to me louder than any preacher ever did. And a preacher came out of that. And the relationship ended because now I see God had his purpose in it. His purpose was to get me here. And I didn't come today to speak to the next future preacher. I came today to talk to the next good man. God has enough preachers, believe me. He needs some more construction workers. He needs some more restaurant managers and restaurant owners. He, he needs some more doctors. He needs some more lawyers. He's got enough preachers. He didn't come to take over the church. He came to build a kingdom. A kingdom without walls. It becomes a kingdom when you take it outward. And today, God gave us a text that I've read for years, but I never quite understood. It's not just any text. The whole text is about fatherhood. The girl who has no father, Jesus becoming the father. The little girl who has a father, J. Iris, he's pressing to Jesus to be a father. The text is all about fatherhood and the void of fatherhood. And today God is just looking for somebody that will say, yes, it's going to get heavy. But can I get you to have a mentality that says, it falls on me. J. Iris, I need feeding your family to fall on you. I need you to be like Jesus and be the provider that your family needs you to be, not the provider you want to be. You may want to be the one that makes the most money, but that may not be what your family needs you to be. But if God can get you to be the one your family needs you to be, then you can experience your whole situation shift. But can God get you to toughen up and carry the weight that is going to come with getting what you're praying for in this season? Because every blessing has a weight to it. Every cross, Jesus would say, also has a crown. But you cannot get the crown without the cross. Every blessing, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, he passed it. Every blessing is going to have a broken season. But God sent me today to speak not only to the fathers, but to speak to the sons and the daughters. The ones who may have never quite had a father. The ones who had a father. 
The ones who had a father that was there but wasn't present. This text is for everybody. No matter where you are, God is your replacement father. God can raise up good fathers. What do you need from God today? And are you willing to carry the weight of making it happen?